Take a look at this photo taken in Port Skewit, South Wales. This is Harold's Field. It's dotted with mysterious lumps and bumps, and I reckon it's going to be a real cracker of a sight. Picture the scene. It's 1065, the year before the Battle of Hastings, and Harold Godwinson, soon to be king, is riding up this slope looking for a site for his brand new hunting lodge fit to entertain royalty. Why here? Well, it's always been strategically important. It's on the main crossing point for anyone wanting to go from England through to Wales. The Romans built here, the Welsh had a royal palace here, but amazingly, no one's ever dug here. Up till now. Time Team have got just three days to find out what really is under Harold's Field. Most of us know King Harold as a loser, the Saxon king killed by an arrow in the eye at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. But what many people won't know is that he was actually a very successful warrior in the years before he became king. As Earl of Wessex, he owned land that bordered Wales and personally is a big fan of Harold. I'm looking forward to finding out what he was doing here in Port Skewit. The reason why no one's ever dug here at Harold's Field before is that way back in 1928, it was deemed so historically important that they made it a scheduled ancient monument, which means nobody's allowed to excavate it. But this is Kate Smith, who lives locally, don't I you? I do, I live over the road in Subbrook. And Kate organised this petition. Would you like to see a professional excavation at Harold's Field? That was very enterprising of you. Why did you do that? Well, because nobody knows for certain what's under the, under the field, and and uh, we have a lot of very curious villagers who would love to know. So once we got this petition, we had to contact Cadu, who are the Welsh equivalent of English heritage, aren't they? Very good. Rick, it seems a bit odd to me that this place was scheduled in the first place, given that we don't really have any idea what's here. Well, I had a look in our files to try and answer that question myself. And, and the inspector who came in the 1920s would have seen what we see, the earthworks, the position, and so on. But it seems to be the place name, Harold's House or Harold's Field, that seems to have been the clincher to make this a protected site. So we start with the name. Yes, but we've also got a really nice piece of evidence from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and that tells us that in 1065, Harold came here and built a hunting lodge. Um, but we don't know whether it was exactly in this field. We know it was in Port Skewit. The name itself could have been attached to it in Victorian times. We've got this um, fantastic drawing by the Reverend Green from 1893, which shows our earthworks looking remarkably similar to the way they look today. Um, and underneath, he's written remains of Harold's hunting tower at Port Skewit. Look at this face. <laughs> that is undiluted scepticism, isn't it? I just wonder if they've put two and two together. You know, they've got a field full of earthworks next to the church. They've got this reference and they've combined it. I mean, Actually, very often we don't know what there is within a, an nope. area of a scheduled monument, do we? I mean, it's obviously earthworks. They draw a line round it. Nobody ever looks at it. Well, the sooner we start digging, the sooner we're going to know exactly what is buried under these mysterious lumps and bumps, and if they've got anything to do with Harold's hunting lodge. The first trench it's been decided is going in here, across the biggest, most obvious lump in Harold's field. It stands out so well, in fact, that we haven't waited for Geophys to survey it. Instead, they'll crack on to give us a picture of what's going on in the rest of this field. Half past ten on day one, and we've already got the first trench going in, which is very good news. Unfortunately, there's some bad news as well. We've got a wounded soldier. How did we do this? We don't know, Tony. I mean, this is a sort of temporary measure, but I've done something to my wrist. What it means is I can't dig. So what can you do? I can use my brain. I can, I can still observe the archaeology, I can still interpret it. It would just mean that I'll get into other people's trenches and make myself extremely unpopular, just like you do, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure we're going to need Phil's experience. But right now, I want to hear more about the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the evidence that connects Harold with Port Skewit. We've got a splendid reference to 1065, which is often overshadowed by, of course, stirring events the following year. But it's absolutely specific. In this year before Hlamas, Harold ordered the building in Wales at Port Skewit, and there too many goods gathered. He wished to invite King Edward here for hunt meats. So the implication is of a great hunting lodge. So this is before he's king. King Edward is king. Why is he in Wales in the first place? He's consolidating his, his, his military campaign in 1063 
completely defeated the Welsh armies and the Welsh king there. And it, it's, it's asserting himself in what had been foreign land. He would have been building the most wonderful building. I mean, he's immensely wealthy himself. He's, a, he's second only to the king in terms of wealth and power, of course. And he wants to impress the king. And the king loves his hunting, even though he's quite an old man by now. Well, it sounds convincing, but it could be very difficult to prove it was here. Because even a Saxon building posh enough to entertain the king would have looked something like this. Essentially a timber construction, leaving only post holes in the ground for us to find. Worse still, it may not have been here for very long, because we know it was attacked by the Welsh. The Welsh ba band together and we have a great big gang that come and, and kill the builders and seize all the goods that are assembled here by Harold for hunting and building. So we're not even dealing with a complete building, it appears. So the Welsh burnt down Harold, the Englishman's holiday home? Uh, yes. <laughs> There's a bit of a pattern there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> but for the archaeologists, this dig is about more than just looking for Saxon evidence. This ridge of higher ground was on the main route for anyone crossing the River Severn and there are clues to suggest that this field was occupied over many centuries. Local pottery expert Steve Clark has dug several trenches in the area and found Iron Age, Roman and medieval finds all around the edges of Harold's Field. When you say you've got medieval pottery from here, what sort of date is that in the Well, it's, it's a job to say. It's, it's probably 13th century. It could be 14th, but there's, it's not really closely datable because there's not enough of it. So it's, not Harold yet, then? No Saxon pottery. There's, there's, no, there's one shirt from southern Wales. So if we got something Saxon, that would be We'd a big story. It, yeah. yes, yes, it would yeah. be really big. Key to understanding this site will be making sense of the lumps and bumps. Geophys are busy trying to detect what lies beneath them while Henry is collecting data to make a 3D model. And Stuart seems to be studying them from every angle. He hasn't spotted anything Saxon yet, but he reckons he can see traces of something that would be later in date, a medieval manor. You see, looking over there, that big ridge going across there. There's oh, yeah. a low area between us and that. On this aerial photograph, that's this, this bank coming across here. Mm -hmm. This is a very typical dam holding back water in this area in here, the area we're standing in. So you've got quite a distinctive feature there showing up. You've got this ditch going round. You can see all these earthworks within here, so you're getting the feel of an enclosure going round. So would that be like an ornamental moat? That's right, or a fish pool. A very typical decorative feature going with a, a medieval manor house. The plan is to put in a trench to test Stuart's theory. Well, we've got a big yellow digger. I don't have to use my hand. <laughs> and if we need any digging, I'll get Bridget to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Phil and Bridge are going to open a trench here, across these earthworks, to see if Stuart's right and they are medieval. And no sooner does the trench go in at the bottom of the hill than straight away Phil spots the first find. I mean, how did I see that? <laughs> Not wrong with his eyesight, is there? See, you don't, you don't need your hands to do archaeology. Just need your old eyes. That's the way. So what we need now is a pottery expert. It's medieval. No. Oh, it is medieval. I think it is. When you say medieval in this instance, what, what, yeah. what, what refine that a well, bit more. Somewhere around 1200. Ooh. That would be yeah. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't think, I'm go, I didn't think you were going to say yeah. that early. Oh, no, no, it could, could well be. It's a bit nice, though, yeah. isn't it, eh? It's a great start. We've come straight down on medieval pottery dating to around 1200 AD. So Stuart could be right, and there is a completely unknown medieval manor house here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is, what, what goes on in well, there? Well, it's, it's a bit more degraded in there, but there's definitely the... There's bits of stone coming up. It's a big old, big old stone there. It is, and it's a nice. Let's have area. another nibble in here, please, Ian. What's that a wall there? Well, we don't know yet, but that's what it's looking like. Up on the top of the hill, we could be digging the very posh bit of Stuart's manor house, because we've uncovered a massive spread of stones, and Matt's got his first find of the dig. That's it. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of square. It looks like that squared off piece there. 
have fitted in a wall or something. Yes. Matt reckons there's at least one large collapsed building here, but at the moment it's hard to see because of all the rubble. There are a few pieces of, of very angular stones in the top, so it's quite thick. And then we come down, there's almost clean mortar there, and almost we have an, a possible, I don't know, revetment or wall there, a few large pieces there, but they're all very tumbled. It looks like we might have another building at the other end of the trench, and I'm glad I'm not the one who's got to sort it out. That's a wall. Yeah. And dressed. Yes, absolutely. Unlike all this rough, undressed rubble, this is mm. actually... And that's the uh, only bit of dressed stone yes, we've, we've found. Quite. But could this map, dated 1777, contain a clue to what one of the buildings looked like? And look at the name of the field. Tower Hay. Tower Hay. Yeah. Now, I think that tower field name applies to the fact that there's these big lumps and bumps on the top here. And there was a memory that was a tall building or a stone tower, perhaps an old manor house, but there was a memory of a stone building in this field. Stuart now believes that most of the bigger earthworks are part of the medieval manor house. And this is an exciting discovery in itself. It's possible that these lost medieval buildings could be very early, perhaps even dating back to the period just after the Norman Conquest. But as well as digging the manor, we also want to investigate the pre-conquest history of this hill. So where do we put our next trench in search of some Saxon evidence? What we've got on top, so almost like a, like a big courtyard, but there are areas in here where there are much lower earthworks which don't quite fit that, that same pattern. They're almost interesting because they're blank, in fact. Yeah, they're, they're blank and they're very low and they just don't feel the same substance right. as the other ones. The Geophys survey looks like it's showing more medieval buildings, but it could also be natural sandstone. The only way to find out is put another trench in. Yeah, but see, I think the problem is, in a way, we don't want to know about the things we can see, because these are going to be medieval or later stone yeah. or, or solid structures, whereas if we're talking about something early that might be timber-built, the sort of things that would be contemporary with Harold, you know, late Saxon, early Norman, they're either going to be underneath these or are they going to be in the rather more blank areas? So in a way, we ought to be looking, like you're saying, in the blank areas because that's where we might see the post holes and timber slots of, of earlier structures. Trench 3, it's decided, will examine this geophys blob but also extend into a blank area to see if we can find any trace of earlier occupation. So Trench 3 gets underway on top of the hill. And it doesn't take long to reveal the source of the geophys black blob. There's bits of mortar coming up. A spread of mortar and rubble, probably from the medieval manor house. I don't think they're in situ. So we can take those out then? Yeah. In some ways, finding a complex of posh medieval buildings here isn't surprising because manor houses were often built on important Saxon sites. Essentially, it was a way of showing that a newly conquered area was under new management. Harold, in fact, may have chosen this hill for his hunting lodge because it had long been the site of a Welsh royal court. We could be digging the top of many layers of history in this field. We've talked a lot about the medieval manor and about Harold's hunting lodge, but before that, we've got this possible Welsh royal court, which what? was here for a lot longer. <laughs> what would it have looked like? Well, we don't quite know. There's been a lot of work done on fleece sites in uh, North Wales. What is this thing called? Fleece, the royal seat of the kings of Gwent. Once again, we're talking about a fancy wooden building, built possibly as early as the 7th century. The evidence for it comes from a historical text, The Life of St Tathaeus, which tells how the King of Gwent went in search of a new royal site. The king is on his horse, which he rides without bridle or halter. So the horse miraculously is guided by God to a spot, uh, as the nearest we get is, well nigh to the banks of the Severn. But more specifically, when he arrives here, the horse scratches the ground and, lo and behold, a spring bursts forth. And at just at that point in the life, we have a little bit of verse inserted, which is often an indicator of a much earlier source. So it, 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 it makes the whole thing much more credible. Uh, observe the signs of God. Here the horse stands, here is the place to abide. So God is by God to, to find the place here. 
What a what? very good horse. It's exactly. like exactly. champion the wonder horse on yes. Lassie. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There isn't a spring here now because they all dried up when the Seventh Tunnel was built. But it was described by antiquarians and it's shown on this 1777 map. Oh, yes. There's a church on here. Yes. And there's, it's labelled the springs. Yes. Another one, and there's the rill. And our dam is somewhere down here. Well, it sounds a bit dodgy to me, but the archaeologists seem to believe it. But the problem, Tony, is, is, you know, it's the usual one of how do you find timber buildings of that early medieval period. Yeah. Another clue to why this site became an important place is in the name itself, Port Skewit, which in Welsh means the harbour below the woods. Hard to imagine now because the village is half a mile inland, but in ancient times it's thought there was a tidal creek here linking Port Skewit with the Severn Estuary. Tomorrow we're planning to try and find the creek, but it could be that Phil's trench here on the lower ground has already picked up some evidence of it. Well, across the whole trench is this clay. <coughs> this clay is the alluvium. This is water laying deposits. <coughs> and look what we've got down in here. Now, that piece of pot yeah. is actually in the alluvium. Steve, have you got any yeah. idea what this is? Yeah, it's Seven Valley Ware. It's, uh, it's Roman. It's second, third century. Wow. It's quite distinctive stuff, really. Do you want to get it yeah, out? Sure, yeah, sure. Have a go. Yeah, take You're it You're not allowed to touch it, right? I can do it with my left hand, <laughs> but I can... Supervise. God, it's really claggy, this it's big clay, old, isn't it? Big old piece, though, isn't it? Yeah. Do you reckon this is in situ or has it just been oh, yeah. dumped here? Now, at some stage, the Romans were here and it's got dropped in to the silt, and then gradually the silt has built, built up and up and up. It's so gluey. I'm glad it's not my wrist that's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> here we are, it's coming away. It will take 500 Good years. Man. Now we can start thinking about oh. it. Yeah. Yeah, well. <clears throat> you have a rest, I'll get the rest of the fires out of the tree. <laughs> well, this is our first sign that the site was occupied in Roman times. My beautifully excavated bit of pot comes from a 2nd to 3rd century Roman storage jar that would have looked like this. I said I thought this site was going to be a pretty good one and it hasn't let me down so far. We started off with these earthworks. Underneath it, it looks as though we found the medieval manor and there could be all these layers underneath. Tomorrow, let's hope we can get at some of that early history. Day two here at Port Skewit in South Wales where we're trying to work out what all these lumps and bumps are about. Yesterday we found what we think is a medieval manor right on the top of that hill, but this place is called a Harold's Field, so we're hoping we might have Harold's Saxon Hunting Lodge underneath the medieval manor, but it's more complicated than that. There's so much history here. We could have a Welsh royal court under the Saxon, below that a Roman villa, below that something prehistoric. But what really intrigues me is that we discovered yesterday that in this low ground down here, there used to be a creek which flowed into the River Severn. So once he's sorted himself out, Stuart's going off. Off you go, my son, in order to try and map the creek. Later on, we're gonna put a trench in somewhere around here. We've got our work cut out today. We've got three trenches underway so far, and in Matt's trench, we've unearthed two buildings which we think were part of a medieval manor house. But we don't know how old it is or when it went out of use. It looks like we might have something else coming through here, do you think? Yeah, possibly, yeah. These big, big stones, because behind you, they're all quite small and rubbly, aren't they? But just cleaning yeah. up these, it looks like they're quite they're pretty hefty. Oh, I think yeah. we might have our second, second wall in the trench. <laughs> Phil's trench was put in here to investigate the earthworks at the bottom of the hill. Yesterday afternoon, I excavated this beautiful piece of 2nd to 3rd century Roman pot from over there, but Phil said that this end of the trench, where I couldn't see anything at all, had got more potential. Were you right? Absolutely, Tony. The reason this has got so much more potential is we've got more layers here. We've actually got stratigraphy, and this is where the crucial part of the trench is going to be. You see, your piece of 2nd, 3rd century pot came from this alluvium down here. Now, the important thing is, we've also had pottery from up there, medieval pottery, dated to 1200. 
The point is we've got all these layers in between that will tell us the story. Often when you two say that there's stratigraphy, I can't see anything, but I have to say even I can see that you've got one layer down to there, then you've got this dark layer here, and you've got this mud below it. Exactly. So what we want to know is what is going on in the middle bit, and if we can get more bits of pottery, we can actually fill that gap in between the Romans and the, and the period of 1200. So but, part of that gap would be our Saxon Harold's hunting lodge. Well, it would, but I mean, you know, let's be a bit cautious because we have hell's own difficulty finding stuff between the Roman and the medieval anywhere. Well, that's great, isn't it? We've got a trench here that's cutting into the hill and allowing us to see the earlier history, but Mick's telling me that we might not be able to prove that one of these layers is Saxon. I don't really understand. Why won't we get any Saxon finds? Well, certainly in, in terms of, of pottery, which is, you know, archaeologists rely a lot on pottery, there just doesn't seem to be any about for... Six well, right from the yes. period, it's right from the yeah. end of the Roman Empire <coughs> through until yeah. Norman time. Well, Why? Well, what happened to the pots after the Romans left? Well, it's a very interesting question, and, and we can give you a very feeble answer. It's right. the end of the market economy. The Romans had a number of centres where they mass-produced pottery in Oxfordshire, in uh, Dorset, and so on, and those disappear. I think a lot of it is due to the fact that they were using wooden vessels. Which rot away. Which rot away. Yeah. I mean, where you get a, a wet, a wet uh, context that preserves wood, the vessel, the wooden vessels are there en masse. So, yeah. if we want to find evidence <coughs> of the time between the Romans and the medieval manor, what are we likely to get? The most satisfying thing we would get is, is either some post holes or timber slots or something like that, which were demonstrably after the Romans and before the Norman period. Preferably with, with radiocarbon With dates. something like bone or something that would give us a radiocarbon date that would nicely come out at 900 plus or minus 50. That would be the ideal. But, you know, we're all cynical enough to know that that's, that's a long shot. Well, they may be cynical, but I'm not giving up on Harold yet. Surely there must be something Saxon to find if the hunting lodge was in this field. We're certainly checking the finds very carefully. Steve, our pottery expert, is examining everything under a microscope. And this is the earliest medieval pottery we've found so far. So how do you go about identifying a piece of pottery like this? Well, first of all, it's cooking pot. If you can see that there's soot on the outside yes. and lime on the inside. From the water? From the water, the cooking, yes. They put them in the fire. Identifying pottery is all about recognising the shape, type of clay and the various extras added to it. This has a purple tinge because of the high iron content in the clay and it's typical of pottery made in Ham Green near Bristol. Sand has been added to the clay as a temper to prevent it from cracking in the fire. The cooking pot. And that's what we can see up on the screen, that's isn't it? These, these rounded grains and things are obviously, are obviously sand. And, and what's this great lump? It's also sand as well. It's, it's a quartz grain, which is subangular. But these, these here, which we got really excited because in Wales, these are generally 12th century. <laughs> this cooking pot could have been brought here as early as 1150 AD, less than 100 years after Harold built his lodge here. And it was found in Phil's trench, so gradually we're moving in the right direction. We're making progress in Matt's trench as well. It looks like we're starting to get some dating evidence for our manor house. Yo, well, what have you got? That bit of pot, isn't it? Oh. oh, it's tile. It's uh, some fairly standard medieval tile. A bit thin for roofing tile, isn't it? What do you think? Mm. Might be from a hearth or something like that. Not floor tile, then. It's not floor yeah. tile. It's far too too thin. Hopefully we'll find more clues, but at least it tells us we're dealing with a manor house that was here in the 13th or 14th century. Thanks to some 21st century wizardry, Henry's 3D model of the lumps and bumps is helping to show up the extent of the manor house. It illustrates quite well on the top the, the rectangular nature of where those big lumps and bumps yeah. are where the building is. Yeah. See how oh, yeah, you clearly see defined yeah. that is on Henry's model. Yeah, I'm really pleased with that. That's great. It's good, isn't it? I mean, it's it shows really sharp corners to it, don't they? It's very there? definite, yeah. but what it also shows, if you can swing it back, Henry, things starting to pick up various earthworks down here. 
there's clearly more going on in this area that will tell us something about the mm. history of this site. So, yes, it's, it's been really helpful. Stuart's main challenge today is to find the silted up creek that once connected Port Skewit to the sea. So there's the site just in there. And you can see you've got the coast out here with all the mud flats. All these lines on here, these are medieval strip fields. I, this wasn't flooded in the medieval period because we were able to plough it. But there are areas where you can see stream channels and areas that don't have ploughing on. Could this be where you could bring boats up to our site? The theory is that there was a tidal creek, known locally as a pill, running close to our site. It may well have looked something like this one, which is only a couple of miles away. Phil's going to help with the search for the Lost Creek, and he's wondering what the harbour at Port Skewit might have looked like. I mean, we've got these sort of, well, modern jetties and, and bits and pieces like that. Would, would they have had that, or would they have just literally let it sink down in the mud? It would depend. We, we have got examples of medieval quayside, big stone uh, establishments, but probably the majority of times people would come into these small pills and there wouldn't be a major facility. They'd have a boat that they could bring in on the flood tide and settle on the low tide, unload, then wait for the next tide to come in and flood and go out on the next tide. Our environmental archaeologist Emma is taking a series of soil samples to locate the creek. It's tough going, but already she can tell us there is a silted up channel here and it's four metres deep in places. We're now also digging a new trench based on Emma's work and it's been positioned here to look at what could be the edge of the creek. Meanwhile, Phil's making his way out of his tidal creek into the Severn estuary and he's learning just how much local knowledge and skill was needed in handling one of the most difficult stretches of water in the country. What makes this water so special? It's the speed at which the tide comes in and goes out. An ordinary sailing boat cannot overcome the uh, speed of the tide. The tide runs at up to 10 knots and even more on a spring tide, and the boat does three to four knots. So if you don't get it right, the tide will just take over and you go down backwards. Have you made those sorts of mistakes? Okay, three, yes. I think we all have. <laughs> if the wind drops, then you're entirely left to the tide. Back in Harold's field, we're making real progress unearthing the medieval manor. I've been looking around the sides of this hill for most of today because, quite frankly, the archaeology up here on the top was so complicated, I wanted to give the archaeologists time to have a really good look. The big news is that Matt reckons he's revealed a doorway into one of our medieval buildings. That's lovely, isn't it? Door jam coming yeah, out there. It's just yeah. come up now. Making a nice space for the timber door to fit into. Yeah, door in there. Yeah. We've got a doorway here into one building, and we've also uncovered two walls that are clearly part of a separate building. And both walls, bizarrely, have been made without using mortar. If you build a good solid stone wall, gravity will actually hold it in place for you. Without having any mortar? Yeah, no mortar. Oh, until it begins to fall down, mm. because then it seems to have crashed right down the hill, gravity assisting in its collapse. On top of Ian? Yeah. <laughs> Ian's up to his neck in rubble, but he's also finding a lot of medieval roof tile. But underneath this rubble here, we've had this layer of roof tiles, which I think means that the building was actually didn't fall down, it was brought down, demolished. They took the roof off, threw away what they didn't want, and then they took the walls down and threw down all this rubble on top of the roof. It's taking a lot of time, but we're slowly making sense of these medieval buildings. And up in the helicopter, Stuart's ready to report to Mick. He reckons he's worked out where the creek ran up to Port Skewart. The church sits on a little promontory of high ground. Can yeah, you see that? I can, I can see the edge of that, yeah. yeah. The low ground, you can trace in a channel out towards that electricity pile. Oh, yes, up. I can see it going across the field. You there. can see the channel to the right carrying yes, on. Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah. that's the line of the original creek. Phil's boat at the moment is here, and he's looking from water level at what would once have been the entrance point into the creek. So, literally, everything that's forming the shore now is silted up? Yes, it looks like featureless mudflat. 
but in fact that's changed with the new medieval seawall coming in and could have been our pill during the early medieval period. Colin, if you were coming into a harbour here, what can you can you tell me? Would it be a favourable place for harbour? Well, yes. First of all, the tide would have pushed you nearly right up here, having bounced off the English stones, and then the last little bit with the westerly wind as we have now, you would have just sailed straight in, which is exactly what we're doing. And if we go very much further, we're going to be on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> we better turn around and go back. Ready, Mark? <laughs> Well, that's great. We've located the long lost creek that once connected Port Stewart with the Severn Estuary, allowing boats to reach here from places like Bristol, just across in England, and the wider world beyond. But was the creek still flowing when our manor house stood proudly on this hill? The news is that we've got enough pottery now to date these medieval buildings. Good idea because the, the pottery is a lot of it's from Bristol and it's, uh, it's a type of pottery which doesn't come in until the second half of the 13th century and, and goes out in the 14th. And how does late 13th century time with the history? Well, actually, very, very well because the one and only reference we have to Port Stewart after Harold's time is here, dated 1271, survey of the forest of Wentwood, and one Matthew Denneband is resident here in a house at Port Stewart. And he's got three privileges. House boot, the right to cut timber to build houses. Hay boot, the right to cut timber to build fences. And fire boot, the right to cut certain types of timber for his house fire. Well, now we really are getting somewhere. We've got a 13th century manor house and the name of someone who lived here at the time. We also know it was pulled down in the 14th century, well before the creek dried up. In our trench here at the bottom of the hill, much of the day has been spent investigating this ditch which we can now confirm also belongs to the medieval manor. But it's meant that we haven't had time to investigate the layers Phil pointed out to me this morning. With Roman pottery at the bottom and medieval at the top, we could have a layer of Saxon history in the middle. I've been promised we'll definitely find out tomorrow. Day three here in Port Stewart in South Wales, and our last chance to find evidence of Harold's Saxon hunting lodge thought to have been in this field. What we've learnt so far is that many of the big lumps and bumps here belong to a 13th century manor house, which is causing a lot of excitement at the moment. There's all this work stone coming. We found oh, this crikey, lovely worked yeah, bit there. So we took that out, thinking it was rubble, and underneath, another one the same, and another one the same, all stacked up. Well, what, about, what about that as well? Oh, oh yeah. There's two more there, look. <laughs> Well, that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. That's the side of a doorway, I would have thought. Ah, door, the door jam. Well, yes, and you, you've presumably got a stack of them. These stones were part of the door. Slowly, we're starting to build up a picture of what these buildings look like. You see, it sticks Oh, yes, out. yes, So yes. I guess maybe those or similar stones would have been, out, would have been on there. That would make sense, as that's the doorway there, and you're coming into something this way. Yeah. And if you're coming into something, then presumably... This earthwork and this parched grass is, is the inside of it. Mm. Oh, I just wonder if this isn't the tower that yeah. the field's named after. Well away from the medieval rubble, we're going to have one last stab at finding some earlier structures on this hill. Our last trench is going in here. If we're lucky, this bit of the field might not have been built on in medieval times, and we might come straight down on some Saxon evidence. Oh, that's nice medieval, isn't it? That is nice medieval. That's very nice. What, 13th century, I think? That's still early, then. Yeah, that's nice. There's so much good archaeology here that Phil will be happy whatever we find. But personally, I'll be disappointed if we can't find anything to prove the Saxons were at least here in 1065 AD. I'm told my best chance is in this trench. Here we've exposed a series of layers in the slope of the hill that could allow us to get at any Saxon evidence if it's here. Ooh. So how are you getting on then, Tracy? That's looking interesting. Yeah, it's not what we expected. We were peeling off this redeposited clays forming the terrace yeah. to find the earlier ground surface. And is it coming off easily at that level? It is, it's just peeling off of this. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. 
That is definitely the level, isn't it? But what we didn't expect was this yellow degraded sandstone. The top layers, which have now been removed, dated to 1200 AD. They were put down to create a terrace on the side of this hill, and it looks like similar terracing has been going on in much earlier times. Could this be evidence of activity here in the Saxon period? Mick tells me it's rare to find Saxon pottery, but we have to hope for some dating evidence as Tracy carefully unpicks these layers. A worn coin of Harold, I think. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll do my best with Thankfully, I'm not the only one who's optimistic about finding some trace of the last great king of the Saxons. Our historian Sam is backing me all the way. Oh, uh, absolutely. And looking at the historical context here, I'm, I'm sure he was here. I'm just waiting for the archaeologist to... Prove it. Yeah, exactly. It's not our fault if they're a bit slow. Victor's got him hunting. Is that just because he built a hunting lodge, or did he really like hunting? Oh, he undoubtedly liked hunting. It was all part of the territory of being a great warrior and a war leader, because it was such great training for mobility over land, lines of approach, all this sort of thing. That's why it's always associated with, with warriorship and rulership. What we all remember about 1066 is him losing the Battle of Hastings. Yeah. But in fact, after he became king at the beginning of 1066, he started off being really successful militarily, didn't oh, he? Oh, he did very well. One of the greatest victories of all time over an invader was the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Where he defeated the Vikings. Exactly, Harold Hardrada. It was, it was an all-time success. But, of course, overshadowed by the dramatic events of only a couple of weeks later, uh, at, down at Hastings. And he nearly won at Hastings. Oh, it was such a close-run thing. It was like a last-minute goal, really. But it, if it hadn't been for that stupid arrow in the eye, Harold could well have won and would be now as famous as Queen Elizabeth or Henry VIII. Yes, it would have been the, the beginning of a great line. And he However. just looked up at the wrong moment. <laughs> One thing we have found that was here in Harold's time is the old river creek that allowed boats to reach here from the sea. Emma's soil survey has shown us that it was at least four metres deep and likely to be just as wide. This trench, put in to test Emma's results, found this edge of the creek. Emma's now working here, trying to find the end of the creek, but I'm a bit confused. Stewart's told me there was a huge pool of spring water in this area, held back by this causeway that acted like a dam. Or haven't I got that right? That, that's absolutely right, but we think that causeway going across there is a late, much later than the Saxon period, oh. well into the medieval period. But before that, the creek came up through here. So take that away. Yeah. The creek came up here. And what you've got is this, the land rises up where you get to, to where the, the fence is over there. Yeah. And this area here looks be, to be where that creek comes through and joins the land. So we asked Emma if she'd do some oil green to see what she could find. And what you got, Emma? I found some sand, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that like it was Christmas. <laughs> I'm, I'm so to glad. Make Stuart happy. <laughs> <laughs> she has made me very happy, I have to say. And there we go. Yeah, that's exactly what we look. That's beach. That's beach sand. So this is the place at which the water would come up to, where you would bring boats up to, drop them on the beach settlement growing around around the head of that. That's exactly what you've got there. This is absolutely brilliant this stuff that right. Emma's done here. Rediscovering the tidal creek has allowed Henry to create a 3D model to show the approach to Port Skewart in Saxon times. Right, what you're actually seeing here is the 1940s aerial photograph over the top of the topography. But what the work that Emma's been doing and some of the map work Stuart's been doing has shown is just how wide this area of wetland with creeks running through it would have been running right up to our site here. You'd have been able to bring a vessel up this creek up here, right into the landing spot there in the, in the Saxon and Norman periods. No doubt about that at all. It's fantastic, but then so is the news from this trench, because a few minutes ago, Tracy turned up, guess what? Two bits of pottery from one of the lower layers of the trench. Could they be Saxon? He's just said to me that he's feeling cautious but excited. <laughs> And we've got all these these books here of stuff called Chepstow ware and <laughs> lots of little fragments of pottery. Why are you excited? Well, be because the fabrics are so distinctive, really. Under the microscope, there's uh, limestone, angular limestone, there's quartz. But that fabric with the quartz, with the vertical rim, is identical to, the, to this one in Chepstow. OK, so we found something that is like something that's been found in Ches yeah. Chepstow. Yeah. What's the significance of it? Well, it, it, the dating. And what is that dating? Late 11th, early 12th century. Yes. Oh, 
this is great. I, I, Couldn't I'm be better, very could excited. it? Yeah, That's no, what I, we want. I, We're very close to the Congress. Late maybe. 11th century. When you say late 11th century, could it actually be before 1066? I, I wouldn't have thought so, but it's, uh, it's almost certainly Norman anyway. It's a rare find, unfortunately the wrong side of the conquest. But it means the layer it came from dates to the late 10 hundreds. And Trace is still digging down into what could be earlier layers. The news from the trench we opened this morning, by the way, is that we didn't find anything Saxon. Just a couple of ditches dating to the 12th century. But that may not matter now, because this trench continues to surprise us all. Oh, hang on. Ah. Ooh, hey. Ah, indeed. It looks like we've got another bit of potential Saxon pottery. It's back to the microscope. I have to say, I never thought I'd be so interested in a few scrappy old bits of pot, and Sam, in the excitement, has turned into a geologist. It's, 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 it's oolitic limestone tempered. What's an oolitic? Eggs, eggs. Little eggs. Um, that's what Made of eggs? <laughs> Dinos, tiny, lots of tiny, tiny little eggs from ancient tropical oceans that form these limestone uh, geological layers. The, the Cotswolds. See, that, that's a void that's... That's a see, very distinctive. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So that w may, may yes. well have been where there was an oolith. Oh, they're, they're oolites, they are. They're, 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 I don't doubt Oolite. that. You, you definitely would say that, would you? Oh, yeah, but, but you see, the Saxon and the Norman have oolites. I mean, we don't see that Saxon pottery in, in Wales. So this is one of two we, we types. Do, yeah. This is yeah. either oolitic limestone pottery from the late Saxon, or yeah. if it's another type, it's early Norman. Yeah, yeah. without but, the eggs. Yeah. But, yeah. but we I, don't know which yet. No, Sorry, but I, I, they may, the inclusions may be too leached for me to say. Uh, you know, you need Alan Vince on this. You Let's hope the inclusions on. aren't too leached. <laughs> 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 If you visit our website, you can find out more about Harold and probably more than you'd want to know about Saxon pottery. But right now we're running out of time. The villagers who invited us here are turning up to see what we've been able to discover about Harold's field. And in Matt's trench, we're nearly ready to tell them. We're down deep enough to find the floor of this building. Oh, at last, excellent. What is it? What, what they made that? Stone. Yeah, it's, it's sandstone. These are harder. Mm. These are limestone. Yeah. Strange thing, it doesn't seem to be it seems to be lower than the the bottom of the wall there, doesn't it? This is so typical of you, Mick Aston. We're all working away in the freezing wind over in the field, and you're sloping off to the church. We're working away on the church. Rick reckons we can tell the villagers when the manor house was built. This church dates to the early 1100s, and he's noticed it's got similar stonework to this bit which he's lugged across from Matt's trench. Well, I mean, I would suggest that you could put it almost yeah. exactly yeah. into that doorway. It's the same type of stone, even exactly though the, the colour looks different, stone, doesn't it? The same block size, yeah. same detailing. The windows have been added in the early 1200s, and they too are a match for some of our dressed stones suggesting that our manor house was altered at the same time. So that one, yeah. we're comparing with this one. Yeah, so we can, by comparison with this window, suggest that perhaps in the early 13th century, there's a significant alteration yeah. to that great tower that Matt's working. So Mick, what do you think is the relationship between this church and what we've got over there? I think it's, it's a very direct relationship, which you see all over the country, which is the manor house has the church next to it. And, and that's usually because they start out as the private property of the people in the manor house. It's only later they get dragged away and become the parish church. The church and manor house were probably built by the same stonemasons. But can we now say which bits of the manor house we've been digging up? I think what we're looking at here is the doorway into a 12th century tower. I mean, it's right. magnificent. Inside, you've got the floor, and then you go out through the doorway over the threshold. That's that big stone down That's there. That's that big see, slab yeah. there. And then you're outside the building. Yeah. And then our trench turns right and goes down the hill. And what the trench has done is, is cut through a range of buildings along that side. Yeah. 
which are later 13th century and I think probably are, are, are likely to be a stable block. They've got a, a central sort of walkway going through. And we've got no later 13th century pottery from there anyway, no. have we? So it's, it's not domestic. No, I don't place. think it is. So we know these big earthworks sketched long ago in Harold's Field are not the remains of Harold's Saxon hunting tower. And we can now reveal to the villagers what was under the lumps and bumps. The main building we unearthed was a Norman fortified tower house, likely to have been three storeys high. Next to it there was a stable block, and these earthworks are likely to be a courtyard with ancillary buildings set around it. Encircling the hill was this deep ditch, and the impressive route in was across this causeway, with the creek on one side and a large lake of spring water on the other. This was the home of the local lord, but not the centre of power as it was in Harold's day, because in Norman times, their base was at Chepstow Castle down the road. But what I hoped for was something to link this field with Harold. Did we get any pre-conquest pottery? We've got some of the earliest medieval pottery ever found in Wales. Really? Uh, it's very exciting. But is any of it proof that the Saxons were here? We've just got a fragment out now. It could well be you know, pre-Norman, uh, almost certainly, but... Which bit's that? It's a very small piece there. Oh. Right. It's not too fanciful, then, to say that this could be from the time of King Harold? No, not at all, because we know it's that much earlier in the sequence. Well, it's not much, but finding this from a time when there simply wasn't much pottery feels like discovering the Holy Grail. This is chaff-tempered ware, and it's Saxon. I can hardly believe it. We can tell the locals that we found evidence of activity here just before the Norman Conquest. And for me, it's proof enough that Harold was here. Our historian Sam is convinced that Harold would have built his hunting lodge on this important hill, intending it to stand out as a symbol of new power to anyone arriving in the creek below. So basically what we've discovered is that this is a really classy place yep. and if you didn't know it already, you're really <laughs> posh people to live here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much.